earlier this year, we launched uh, what we call My Brother's Keepers. It's all about uh, a whole bunch of folks, educators, business leaders, faith leaders, foundations, government, all working together to give boys and young men of color the tools that they need to succeed and make sure that every young person can reach their potential. My Brother's Keeper, while launched this year by President Obama, is by no means a brand new initiative. It's a new name, it's a catchy name, um, and it's great that it was announced now by our the nation's first black president. However, the work about of funding black men and boys, of funding programs that serve men and boys of color, goes back about 20 years or more. In the aftermath of the acquittal of George Zimmerman, who um, killed uh, Trayvon Martin, the president it responded um, to the grief that was widespread um, with what he considered to be the interventions that he could put, put forward. There would not be any serious or significant structural kind of interventions, new programs to fight the rollback of civil rights and other kinds of social protections. Instead, it was going to be a healthy fatherhood kind of initiative in which there would be no government money, but there'd be essentially these feel-good kind of programs that provide important things, but they don't provide the kind of things that would actually make a difference. Our dollars have almost created um, a deficit in funding for women and girls of color, right? And so not only are we funding programs and interventions, but we're also funding research. Um, and foundations that do the work with integrity, um, as most of my colleagues are doing, and as the folks at the Men and Boys of Color table are doing, ground their work in research, right? And so they seek to do root cause analysis, and then that informs the philanthropic strategy. And so they've invested in the research to find out what is happening to men and boys of color, and have not invested in the research for women and girls of color, and therefore cannot have a philanthropic strategy to address the needs of women and girls. I would have loved to see in the program and still hope to see in the program, there's still time to see in the program, a gender and racial inclusive lens that also includes girls of color, LGBTQ youth, trans youth, and gender non-conforming youth. We can't wait any longer. This has been going on far too long. It's time for people to realize we're part of an integrated community. We're in the same families, same communities, same schools, same churches. And so anything that's going to work holistically for the community has to work for women too. We've been waiting for over 23 years. This has been going on since the late 80s, early 90s. This isn't going to go away. It's not suddenly going to be the case that someone's going to wake up and say, oh yeah, we forgot about the women and girls. This has created its own industry, its own frameworks, its own understandings. And in that understanding, women of color and girls are simply marginal, or they can handle it themselves, or they're really not suffering as much. The fundamental problem at this point is much of the data that has been used to support the exclusion of women and girls is only data that asks the question about men and boys. So they're basically predicating the exclusion of women and girls on the fact that they've excluded them all along. To my colleagues in philanthropy, I'd say we can do more and we can do better. Right now, it feels like we're having a conversation that's grounded in scarcity. And that makes absolutely zero sense to me. We are philanthropy, right? And so we have the resources and the ability to go where government can't or won't. We actually get to be bold. We know anecdotally that women and girls, particularly our girls, are in as much crisis as our boys. We ask young people what they would do if they woke up the opposite gender the next morning. This is third grade. If I woke up as a girl, I would feel insane and would kill myself and jump out my window. And then I would put lipstick on. More scared to walk home because I might be kidnapped or raped. I'd kill myself because boys get to do things girls don't. I wouldn't want to lose my privileges. I would feel stupid, go back to sleep, I would not come to school, and I'd really hurt myself. The girl said, if I woke up a boy, I would rap like a boy, I would exercise like a boy does almost every day. So having the freedom to play, having the freedom to rap and voice who they are, I would have fun flirting with girls. Sexual harassment, I would 
have a different mind like a scientist or something. We have to see ourselves um, both able to talk about gender and able to talk about race in the same breath. They don't have to be separate conversations. So when we say, oh, if you want to deal with women and girls issues, go to the women's donors, we, we have to remember that there is not a racial justice conversation happening there. So the main argument that's been made for the focus on African African American men and boys has worked its way around this canary idea. If we look at racial disparities, um, we're looking at them as indicators that the environment is toxic for all of us. So yes, targeted interventions are necessary because it's important for the entire community that is in this toxic situ situation to be lifted out. The problem in the way that the metaphor is now used is that first of all, people think that the boys are the canaries. Um, they think that the canaries are sick because there's something wrong with them. We think that the way to make them well is to give them breathing apparatuses so they can navigate um, this toxic situation. We don't think it's important to actually clear out the toxic dimensions of the situation. And we certainly don't think it's important for the girls who are also sitting in the same toxic situation to also have some kind of interventions. So it's both individual as opposed to structural, right? And it's gendered besides that. So in fact, excluding the girls is what makes it work. If you say that all of the canaries are sick, it doesn't make sense to equip all of them with, with little breathing apparatuses. When you say everybody is affected, then you say, okay, everybody out. Some people might say they, there may be more programs for girls. And we're saying now's the time for us to have a gender inclusive lens within this racial justice movement. Our girls can't wait. They can't afford to wait. Our boys can't afford to wait. Many people really don't know what's happening to women in our community. They, they don't know that we lost more property than anyone else during the mortgage breakdown. They don't know that we lost more jobs than anyone else during the recovery. They don't know that most of us have $100 uh, of wealth. So we need to step up and tell a story about the particular way that we're suffering in our community as well. And we need to have these conversations with each other. When we're sitting in the beauty parlor and this issue comes up, somebody needs to say, well, I don't think it's right that our girls are excluded. I don't think we're treating them as equals when we don't even care about what's going on in their lives. So this is something that we do have control over. It is our community. It is us. The question is, do we care enough about us to say something about us?